all respected teachers and my dear friends. Today the Department of Critical Care Medicine is going to present a combined clinical rounds. 57 year old female presented with fever, joint pain and weight loss. So I would like to request Dr. Priyambada Gutta ma'am, Professor and Head, Department of Critical Care Medicine to introduce the Department of Critical Care. Good morning, respected Emeritus Chairperson sir, uh, all respected seniors, and dear colleagues and friends. Uh, today I will be giving a brief introduction of our department. Uh, so as we all know, we are the largest critical care centre in the state of Rajasthan. Uh, with following all the international standards of patient care, uh, critical care as an individual department was established in the year 2017 at a hospital. Uh, we have a daily workload of uh, more than 80% bed occupancy. During COVID pandemic, as we all know, we have done exemplary work with uh, attending to around 10,000 inpatients, 26,000 outpatients, as well as providing home care to around 1,000 patients with ICU admissions, 4,200 approximately, and the COVID testing, as we all know, more than 2.5 lakhs. <laughs> this is a team of learned faculty. We have a world-class infrastructure uh, with a patient counseling room, having uh, audio-visual recording facilities and a multi-faith prayer room as well with all the ultra-modern equipments required for uh, good patient care. We started DM critical care courses in 2021, enrolling four students each year. In addition, we are running IDCCM, IDCCM, ICCM, as well as fellowship in neurocritical care. In addition, we are conducting validated courses. We are a AHS certified training site for ACLS and PLS courses, and we are in the process of developing ITC, the International Training Center, as well as we are running ATLS and ATCM courses also. Besides this, we are regularly training our medical students, as well as the paramedical, dental, and physiotherapist uh, for the PLS trainings. Even during COVID, we have conducted 10 training programs, specially training more than 400 doctors and other staff. We are also providing services to a society in form of conducting mass training programs for basic life support and CPR training at various places like colleges, companies, etc. In the last academic year, we have organized multiple workshops in mentioning end of life care, antimicrobial stewardship symposium, focus and USG workshop, as well as ECMO and CRRT workshops. Our faculty has been awarded with multiple awards at multiple occasions. In field of research and academic, we are excelling. We have conducted, completed three multi-center trials and the four ongoing, as well as we have got multiple publications, as well as chapters in books. And our faculty is also participating regularly in Jaipur Swasti Charja and even in Jaipur Videsh Parijay also. Besides academic and research, we are also involved in celebrating various academic days and events, as well as we are also celebrating spiritual days, some religious festivals like Ganesh Chaturthi, Diwali Milan, as well as birthdays of not only doctors but also staff. So now I'd like to invite Dr. Chinmay to further. Good morning to all respected teachers and my colleagues. I'm Dr. Chinmay from Department of General Medicine. Today we'll be going through a case of 57-year-old female patient, resident of Hanumangad and homemaker by occupation, who presented with chief complaints of low-grade fever since 6 months, decreased appetite and weight loss since 3 months, and pain in small joints of hand since 3 months. Patient was apparently alright 6 months back when she started developing complaints of insidious onset fever, which was intermittent type, associated with myalgia, generalized weakness, and relieved on taking antipyretics, there was no diurnal variation of fever. 
Joint pain was in small joints of hands associated with swelling, which increased on movement, and there was history of early morning stiffness. Weight loss was 5 kgs in 3 months. There is no history of cold, cough, cold, breathlessness, chest pain, burning micturation, headache, delirium, loss of consciousness, convulsions, pain in abdomen, diarrhea, rash, oral ulcers, alopecia, or photosensitivity. There is past history of laparoscopic cholecystectomy three years back for polylithiasis, whose histopath was normal, and left sided percutaneous nephrostomy was done two years back for renal calculi. There is no history of diabetes, hypertension, tuberculosis, bronchial asthma or uh, obstetric history of patient was gravida 2, para 2, live birth 2 and 0 abortion. Patient was postmenopausal with menopause attained at 53 years of age and patient's mother had history of rheumatoid arthritis but it was non-documented and she was not on medications. Summarizing the case, patient 57 year old female presenting with complaints of mild grade intermittent fever since 6 months, weight loss since 5 kgs in 3 months, Pain in small joints with swelling and morning stiffness since 3 months. Associated with decreased appetite, history of lab coli and percutaneous nephrostomy, family history of RA and no history of abortions. Can anybody tell me what are the differentials? So going through various causes of fever, joint pains and weight loss, we narrowed it down into three categories. Infective, which can be tuberculosis or HIV. Autoimmune, which can be rheumatoid arthritis, sarcoidosis, or systemic lupus erythematosus, <coughs> and neoplastic, it can be hematological or systemic malignancy. On examining the patient is comfortably lying on bed, oriented to time, place, person, and obeying commands. Pulse is 110 be uh, beats per minute, which is tachycardiac, and temperature was 102 degree Fahrenheit, so patient was febrile. And rest everything was normal on general physical examination. Uh, examining the patient's lymph node, there was right submental lymphadenopathy along with axillary lymphadenopathy which were palpable 2 to 3 centimeters in size, tender, firm in consistency and non-mated. On joint examination, there was swelling and tenderness in bilateral metacarpophalangeal joints and proximal interphalangeal joints associated with wrist joints. Systemic examination, there was tenderness and palpation in right hypochondrium, rest other systems were normal on examination. <coughs> On day 1 of investigation, patient had hemoglobin of 10.7 with normocytic normochromic PBF and raised GSR of 110 mm per hour. Uric acid was 8.9, where urea nitrogen was 93, serum creatinine was 2.1, urine routine showed 10 to 14 WBCs and SGOT PT were raised to 404 and 97. ALP was also raised to 177. Chest X-ray of patient was normal. On USG abdomen, there was multiple abdominal lymphadenopathy, including periaortic, free cable, epigastric, and umbilical lymph nodes, with largest measuring 4 to 2.4 cm in size, adjacent to the external like region, with right upper ureteric calculus, grade 3 fatty liver, and fibroid uterus. Patient was started on piperacillin and tezobectum, with renal modified doses, 8 hourly, and antipyretics were given according to temperature charting. Patient was started on IV fluids as there was decreased oral intake. On day 2 to 5 of investigation, there was not a significant decline in hemoglobin, but it came to be 9.5. Uh, urea nitrogen decreased to 89 from 93. Creat decreased post IV fluid from 2.1 to 1.8. OTPT were significantly increased to 1977 and 714 with ALP rising to 571. Urine routine improved post uh, piperacillin and tezobectum to leukocyte 1 plus WBCs 4 cells and ESR was 103. Patient was febrile, drowsy and tachypneic on day 6 of examination. We got an axillary lymph node biopsy which came to be granulomatous lymphadenitis. So we uh, asked <coughs> for CT abdomen because there was multiple lymph nodes on USG. Antinuclear antibodies were sent in view of decreasing OTPT and ALP with smooth muscle serum IgG and chest x-ray was advised because patient was tachypneic. According to West Heaven criteria, uh, the patient was in stage 1 with deranged LFT and RFT. So we shifted the patient to critical care unit because of the same and patient was managed along with the support of critical care in other departments. So I would like to call Dr. Sulekha ma'am take the course of patient <laughs> Good morning.
मॉर्निंग एवरी वन माई सेल्फ डॉक्टर सुलेखा सक्सेना डी एम रेजिडेंट इन क्रिटिकल केयर मेडिसिन डिपार्टमेंट आई विल प्रोसीड विद द केस सो पेशेंट वॉज शिफ्ट टू द आई सी यू विद नीड ऑफ ऑक्सीजन एंड पेशेंट वॉज डल एंड ड्राउजी एट द इनिशियल इवेल्युएशन इन द आई सी यू पेशेंट एयर वे वॉज पेटेंट एंड द रेस्पिरेटरी रेट वॉज ट्वेंटी सिक्स पर मिनट पेशेंट वॉज मेंटेनिंग सेचुरेशन ऑफ एटी सिक्स परसेंट ऑन रूम वेयर एंड विद ऑक्सीजन सपोर्ट पेशेंट वॉज मेंटेनिंग सेचुरेशन ऑफ नाइन्टी फोर परसेंट विद नेजल प्रॉम पल सेट वॉज हंड्रेड एंड ट्वेंटी पर मिनट पेरीफ्रीज वो वॉर्म ब्लड प्रेशर वॉज हंड्रेड एंड थर्टी बाई एटी एम एम एसी पेशेंट वॉज डल एंड ड्राउजी अकॉर्डिंग टू द बेस्ट इन इन क्राइटेरिया पेशेंट वॉज इन स्टेज वन एंड टेम्परेचर वॉज हंड्रेड एंड टू डिग्री फॉर एन आई एंड प्रीवियस डे इनपुट एंड आउटपुट वॉज टू थाउजेंड बाई ट्वेल्व हंड्रेड एम एल सो बेड साइड ए बी जी वॉज वन इट वॉज शोइंग अ प्राइमरी रेस्पिरेटरी एल्कोलोसिस एलॉन्ग विद हाइपोक्सीमिया एंड ई सी जी वॉज डन विच वॉज नॉर्मल एंड एक्से विच वॉज प्रेजेंट विच वॉज डन इन द वर्ल्ड शोइंग ओपेसिटी इन द मिड एंड द लोअर फॉर्म सो बेड साइड फोकस अल्ट्रा लंग अल्ट्रासाउंड वॉज डन विच वॉज शोइंग अ डिक्रीज लंग स्लाइडिंग एट द राइट ब्लू ए पॉइंट एंड बी पॉइंट विद मल्टीपल पंक्टेड इकोजेनिक फोकाय एंड डायनेमिक एयर प्रोकोग्राम विच वॉज सजेस्टिव ऑफ कंसॉलिडेशन न्यूमोनिया फोकस इको वॉज डन विच वॉज नॉर्मल so we have sent all the routine investigation along with blood culture sensitivities sputum culture and sensitivity urine routine microscopy and culture was sent so uh, the same day oxygen was started at the rate of 6 liter per minute with the help of face mask patient was not maintaining on the face mask so non invasive ventilation trial was uh, initiated with the support of 12 by 6 with fio2 of 50% antibiotic was escalated to meropenem according to creatinine clearance and chicoprenem an style 16 infusion was continued in view of acute liver injury and the hepatology tumors consulted during the course of uh, 7 to 10 day in the icu despite of uh, non invasive ventilation support patient was having tachypnea so uh, patient was planned to intubate and we have intubated the patient and we have ventilated the patient on volume control mode with fio2 of 50% respiratory rate of 22 peep of 5 and tidal volume of 380 and patient was maintaining a saturation of 98% still the patient is having the fever episode Pa patient gcs was low and patient was dull and drowsy ct chest and abdomen report came it was suggestive of lymphadenopathy which will be discussed by radiology department in the detail blood culture and urine reports were sterile so by the end of day 10 we are treating a patient who is having the following issues like patient was having a respiratory failure type 1 pneumonia patient is having a low gcs dull and drowsy transaminitis under evaluation joint pain fever lymphadenopathy in chest and abdomen with a uh, urethral calculus with proximal hydro urethral nephrosis any would like to add anything so to find out the etiology we have done the mri brain and right axillary uh, lymph node excisional biopsy was done uh, so the finding of mri brain will be discussed by dr yashvi jr2 morning respected teachers seniors and colleagues i will be discussing about the radiological findings in the patient so the mri brain was done and this is how a normal uh, flare sequence of axial section of a flare sequence looks like and in the patient we can see the sulci appears a bit brighter as we compare with the normal one we can see the sulci appear darker in the normal patient but if we compare with the patient one the uh, sulci appear brighter indicating the hyper intensities along the sulci so similar hyper intensities were also noted along the cerebella foliae so uh, susceptibility weighted images did not show any blooming so uh, ruling out any subarachnoid hemorrhage so possible differential we should think about this hyper intensity is leptomeningitis leptomeningeal carcinomatosis or it could be due to hyperbaric oxygen therapy related changes and subarachnoid hemorrhage uh, cannot be ruled out completely only on the basis of uh, stepwise images so contrast in on ct chest and abdomen was done and this is an axial section of an ct abdomen showing the multiple enlarged lymph nodes in the uh, iliac region 
And uh, similar can be seen in coronal section as well, multiple enlarged lymph nodes with small areas of uh, hypoattenuation within the lymph node, indicating the small areas of necrosis along the iliac vessels. So uh, this is the again a coronal section showing the parietic lymph nodes, again a small uh, area of necrosis <laughs> within it. And this is a section showing the axillary lymph node and large axillary lymph nodes with central areas of hypoattenuation, again a necro showing the necrosis. So just to summarize the radiological finding on MRI brain, we saw the detuated and flare hyperintensities along the cerebral cortical sulci over the surface of brainstem, basal system, and bilateral cerebral foliar. On the contrast in on CT abdomen, there was generalized necrotizing lymphadenopathy, hepatomegaly with fatty infiltration, the right uretic calculus with proximal hydroureteronephrosis, mild pericardial effusion and bilateral pleural effusion was seen, and with perinephric fat strength. Now, I would like to call Dr. Aditya to discuss about the oncopathology findings. Thank you, Dr. Yashvi. A uh, very good morning to all respected professors, seniors, and fellow residents. I'm Dr. Aditya Mundra from the Department of Oncopathology, and I'll be talking about the histopathological aspects of this particular case. We received excisional biopsy from the right axillary region, and we retrieved multiple lymph nodes. The diameter of the largest lymph node was 1.5 centimeter. Cut surface examination of the largest lymph node showed, showed homogeneous gray white appearance. Microscopic examinations revealed pink acellular pink pink acellular eosinophilic areas. These areas were necrotic areas. These necrotic areas are also termed as city after a war appearance. These necrotic areas were closely intermingled with chronic mononuclear inflammatory cell infiltrate, as we can see over here. So, an immunohistochemical examination was performed on this particular excisional biopsy and multiple antibodies were used. Firstly, CD20 and CD3. CD20 were picked up by all those lymphocytes which are present over here in these follicles, but the lymphocytes in the parafollicular space did not pick up CD20. But CD3 were picked up by all those lymphocytes in the parafollicular spaces over here, but were missed by all the lymphocytes in the follicular spaces. This signifies there is normal lymph node histology and lymphomas is ruled out. Next, CD4 and CD8. The intensity of expression of CD8 is much more greater than CD4 as we can see over here. This signifies that the necrosis present in the lymph node is probably due to cytotoxic T cell damage. Finally, CD68 and MPO. CD68 and MPO showed positive staining in all the macrophages present within the lymph node. Myeloperoxidase, sir. Myeloperoxidase. So to summarize all the histopathology and immunohistochemistry findings, there were presence of necrosis and viable mononuclear inflammatory cells in a normal topographical distribution. There was reactive distribution of CD3 and CD20. There was positivity of MPO and CD68 in the histiocytes. There were absence of epithelioid cell granulomas and multinucleated giant cells, the Langange type of giant cells. And the intensity of expression of CD8 was greater than CD4. So final diagnosis of necrotizing lymphadenitis was given. And the closest differential diagnosis for this particular case were Kikuchi's Fujimoto's disease, lymph, uh, lupus lymphadenitis, and any infectious etiology. Now I request Dr. Sulekha Saxena to come to the dais and further discuss the case. Thank you. So till now we are dealing with uh, a patient who came with a history of fever, joint pain and weight loss and uh, on MRI diagnosed as a uh, suspicion of tubercular meningitis. Why don't you ask the audience, like there's too little audience interaction. Uh, are they going to say a question which I have? So I request Dr. Sachana to drive the discussion and drive the residents to answer. I think we start off with the medical, I mean, medicine residents. Anybody who's willing to come up with a diagnosis and further management. <coughs> no volunteers? If there are no volunteers, we have to pick and choose. Probably, uh, sir, probably uh, TB meningitis with uh, left uh, 
nephrolithi acids causing uh, obstructive uropathy with pyelonephritis with sepsis. <coughs> Fever, fever, lymphadenopathy, and uh, ESR is raised. And the biopsy may be necrotizing, necrotizing lymphadenopathy. So necrotizing lymphadenitis, she has mentioned another thing, that is Kikuchi's disease. What is that? Uh, right. Kikuchi Fujimoto, this is a self limiting disease uh, that is mainly a histiocyte involved uh, lymphadenitis, a necrotizing lymphadenitis that can occur all over the body and all the lymph nodes. Uh, however, it has a very self-limiting course and uh, it does not usually present with so many complications. And also it can be managed with just short course of steroids if uh, symptomatic. But otherwise it's a histiocyte cause necrotizing lymphadenopathy. What is the cause of this? Sir, insulting agents can be a fever, uh, can be infection. <laughs> And uh, there can also be an association with SLE, for which we have to be very much uh, monitoring the patient about. Like the moment we get Kikuchi Fujimoto suspicion, we should immediately rule out presence of SLE as well, because then it becomes life threatening, such as one of the complications being HLH. Uh, thank you, sir. You have very nicely explained all the questions. Mm -hmm. I think it was a full explanation. <laughs> What about the joint pains? Sir, actually there is a one uh, differential uh, lupus we are keeping in uh, the diagnosis uh, as in histopathology. No, so on histopathology, we uh, gave first differential is Kikuchi disease. Kikuchi disease. Kikuchi disease. Kikuchi disease. Yes, but in this case, I am favoring Kikuchi disease because uh, there are keratinic debris along with <coughs> absence of neutrophils. Neutrophils, absence of neutrophils, absence of plasma cells. This favors Kikuchi disease because in lupus lymphadenitis you you will see uh, plasma cells you will see neutrophils along with hematoxylin bodies hematoxylin bodies are not there in this case and keratinic uh, debris there is uh, there is a special type of necrosis that, uh, that is keratinic uh, debris in the background of uh, non neutrophilic non plasmacytic cells. So, in this case, I am favoring Kikuchi disease over lupus lymphadenitis. Yes, sir. First, we have kept the diagnosis Kikuchi disease, then we have actually uh, kept the lupus. Immuno immunostic chemistry is also in favor of yes, Kikuchi sir. because yes, CD8 is more than CD4. Yes, in lupus lymphadenitis, yes. CD4 will be more than CD8. Yes, sir. So, till now, sir, as you all have said, we have kept the R differential as we are treating a patient who is having a who came with a fever, joint pain, and uh, had pyelonephritis, pneumonia, and on MRI it was suggestive of tubercular meningitis. On histopathology it was suggestive of Kikuchi's disease. So on the on this line only we were treating the patient. So because MRI brain was suspicion having suspicion of uh, tubercular meningitis, the CSF analysis was done. Yes, sir left of meningitis. So we have planned for the CSF analysis and the protein was raised, ADA was raised and uh, gram stain AMP and Indian ink was negative <coughs> and uh, was negative. So suspicion of tubercular etiology. So we have started with the renal and hepatic modified uh, ATT, uh, INH ethambutol and levofloxacin with steroid was started. So by the end of uh, day 10, in uh, in day 11, we were having uh, issues. There was a new onset of shock and there was a fall in blood pressure and tachycardia. There was an increased amount of purulence and uh, there was an amount and purulence both was increased in the ET secretion. And the trends of lactate were rising. Liver functions, they were declining in the drain. And there was an acute kidney injury which was non-oligoeuric type. And the altered level of sensorium was still present. So we evaluated the shock and we we find out the shock is basically septic type because the point which was going in the favor of septic shock, the fever was present and the source of sepsis was proven on the X-ray and ultrasound, it was pneumonia and the trend of lactate which was going up, it was more than 4 millimole per deciliter. 
So we have managed the septic shock, we have uh, resuscitated the patient with the fluid and we have sent the blood cultures and we have started with the vasopressor therapy and center line and arterial line was inserted with ultrasound guided and in view of new onset shock we have escalated the antibiotic and we have added the polymixin. So, uh, the next, uh, over the next days, uh, we have, uh, the basis of patient was still low, weaning trial was given, but it was failed. Blood culture sensitivity was showing no growth. So, we have planned for de-escalation of antibiotics. And because non-oligouric type of AKI, injection furosemide was started. Because patient was having low GCS, so thinking that patient will need a long-term ventilation, we have done the percutaneous tracheostomy and the trend of liver function was improving. So day 16 patient uh, was on ventilator, vasopressor supports was stopped, ET culture sensitivity was showing a acinetocomony. The colony forming unit was more than 1 lakh and procalcitonin level was 1.96. So we have started with the cholesterol nebulization. The very next day patient, uh, some ECG changes was noted on the monitor. ECG was showing a sinus tachycardia with inverted T waves in V1 to V4. And the 2D echo was done which was showing a LV hypokinesia. Ejection fraction was 30% and mildly enlarged left ventricle with no pulmonary artery hypertension with trivial TR. It was suspicion, having suspicion of stress-induced cardiomyopathy. Cardiology reference was taken and they have uh, asked for start the injection furosemide 20 mg PT. So over a period, patient was still having a GCS low, weaning failure was there and there was a new issue, patient was having anemia and thrombocytopenia. The platelet count was 42,000 and we have done the peripheral blood smear that was having fragmented RBC with 4% of cystocytes that was suggestive of hemolytic anemia with retic count of uh, it was increased and so we have planned for the thrombolestogram. Coagulation profile was sent and in view of all this we have sent a hematology reference. So the hematological finding will be discussed by Dr. Omka, uh, senior resident from the Department of Clinical Hematology. Very respected teachers, seniors, and colleagues. <laughs> I'll be taking this discussion further. Uh, the hematology reference was done in view of anemia and thrombocytopenia. Uh, the complete blood count showed hemoglobin of 6.7 gram per, uh, per deciliter. Total blood count was 12,900 per microliter. Pet rates were 32,000 per microliter. The peripheral blood count showed polychromasia. 4% cystocytes with reduced platelets. Reticulocyte count was 11.5% and character reticulocyte count was 6%. The other blood, blood investigation showed PT, INR, APTT, fibrosis were normal with uh, very high of LTH, 3,547 units per liter and the direct home test was negative. The differential diagnosis in this case are thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura in view of CNS involvement, thrombocytopenia, macroangiopathic myopic anemia, the other differentials uh, was uh, hematic uremic syndrome, HOS, uh, but the point against was no antecedent history of diarrhea. The other uh, 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 differentials in this was systematic uh, intercellular coagulation, I mean, you have patients' clinical scenario with uh, underlying sepsis, uh, but the PT and our APT differentials were normal. The Ivan syndrome was another possibility, uh, which is uh, autohemolytic anemia and uh, immune thrombocytopenic purpura, but the Coombs were negative and the peripheral bursts were short cystocytes. So depending on the clinical scenario and the lab investigations, uh, uh, the thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura was more likely. Uh, so even for plasmic score, it is a score which is used in hospitalized patients uh, with suspected TTP who might benefit from the early incision of plasma exchange. There are seven parameters and the plasmic score of our patient was 5 which falls into the intermediate risk of, uh, uh, risk of identity deficiency. The other test which can help in this scenario was thrombolastography. So this was thrombolastography of this patient, uh, which has five values, R, R time, K time, alpha angle, maximum amplitude, and line 30. The R time was, uh, R time is to time to, to, uh, com, uh, time to form first clot. The K time is the rapidity of clot formation, which is low in case of this patient, 0.8, normal is 1 to 3. The alpha angle is about the rapidity of uh, fibrin accumulation. Uh, 
the maximum altitude uh, shows the torque fineness, which is on the higher side, 68.6 uh, compared to 51 to 69. So, in, since the patient had thermosatopenia, uh, we would expect the uh, low uh, maximum altitude in this patient, but 68.6 from the is, is the higher side of the normal. And whatever the plot formation is very rapid, if you see the K value is 1 to 3, the, uh, is, uh, the value of the patient is 0.8. So the diagnosis is uh, thermosatopenic purpura with underlying etiology of lupus, pneumonia, or tubercular meningitis, or pyonephritis. The confirmatory test for the uh, TTP is Adventist 13 uh, assay. However, the test is not available readily and uh, the turnaround time is very high. So, the plasma exchange, uh, we went for plasma exchange and uh, the treatment of uh, underlying test should be continued. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Nisha from the department of IHBT to discuss this further. <coughs> Good morning everyone, I am Dr. Nisha Raj, first year resident of the Department of Immunohematology and Blood Transfusion. Before I go further, I would like to give a brief introduction of therapeutic plasma exchange. Therapeutic plasma exchange is the process in which we remove the plasma of the patient. Along with the plasma gets removed the pathological substances that are causing the clinical symptoms in the patient. And after removing the plasma, we replace that removed plasma with a replacement fluid. Major factors that get removed during this process include immune complexes, autoantibodies, alloantibodies, protein bound toxins, and inflammatory mediators. If you see in this slide as a picture of the machine that we are using at our center, at our hospital, this is a contact machine from the company for seniors CAPI. This is a multi-purpose machine. It can be used for collection of hemopoietic stem cells. It can be used for collection of granulocytes, plasma, as well as it is used for therapeutic plasma exchange. Each process, there is a different kit which has been provided by the company. All the proce procedures that are done are done in the ICU setup under the guidance of a transfusion medicine specialist. Uh, the basic principle of therapeutic plasma exchange includes drawing the blood of the patient, mixing it with an anticoagulant, passing it through a centrifuge. Collection of the plasma happens because the heavier cellular components of the blood settle down and the lighter plasma settles above that. That is how it is collected and removed. And the remaining cellular components of the blood get retransfused to the patient along with the replacement fluid. In our hospital, we are following the American Society of Apheresis guidelines. And it is under the under the super under the sanction and permission of the drug controller of India, as well as this, uh, the American Society of Apheresis guidelines specifies 91 diseases with 166 indications, which have been classified into four categories and two grades. Now, since this patient was suspected to have thrombocytopenic thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, it falls under the grade 1A and category 1. That means that. TPE is strongly recommended in a patient who is having thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura because the mortality rate is high in cases of patients who are not treated and by providing uh, therapeutic plasma exchange to such patients, the mortality rate is reduced to 10 to 20 percent. The basic rationale of using it, uh, using therapeutic plasma exchange in such patients is the removal of the anti adam ts 13 antibody. Before starting any procedure, we need to follow a few prerequisites. The prerequisites have been mentioned over here, include, which include blood group, weight, height, hemoglobin, hematocrit, platelet count of the patient, ionized calcium values, serum electrolyte values, normal serum proteins, venous assets, replacement fluids, anticoagulation, and patient history and consent. Now the question comes of replacement fluid. Which replacement fluid we will be using in this patient? So we have chosen fresh frozen plasma as the replacement fluid for this patient. Fresh frozen plasma contains the anticoagulants and uh, we use fresh frozen plasma for patients who have deranged liver enzymes. So fresh frozen plasma was a chosen replacement fluid for this patient. Now the question comes of calculation of the plasma volume to be processed during each cycle. So for that we need to calculate the total blood volume of the patient. Total blood volume is calculated by the Witcher's rule of 5 or Tatler's equation that is mentioned here. Once we get the total blood volume, we can calculate the total plasma volume of the patient by the formula that is given below. Calculation of the plasma volume to be processed uh, is done on the basis of 
the ASCA guidelines that have been given, that is the American Society of Apheresis guidelines. So in one sitting, if the total plasma volume of the patient, the total plasma volume of the patient is processed, which is equivalent to the plasma volume of the patient, it is known as a one volume exchange. And it is expected that 30% uh, the uh, remaining pathological substance would be there. I mean, 70% of the pathological substance gets removed in one sitting. But if at the same sitting you do a two volume exchange, the efficacy reduces because of the diminishing effect of the reducing plasma volume. So, as per as per guidelines, it is being recommended that 1 to 1.5 volume exchange be done in a particular sitting. In this patient, we have done 1.1 to 1.3 plasma volume exchange in the four cycles that we, were done, that we had done at our hospital. Now, there is another question that arises, that is the duration and the frequency of HTP to be done. Now, it depends on the response of the patient and the tolerance of the patient as well as the synthesis and catabolism of the offending agent. In TTP, it is recommended that we do uh, repeated uh, therapeutic plasma exchange uh, till the platelet count has come up to 1.5 lakhs as well as the LDH value has come to normal and it has stayed normal for 2 to 3 consecutive days. Now this is a bird's eye view of the lab reports of the patient. Uh, we had done a total of 4 cycles at our center that is on day 19, day 20, day 22, day 24 of admission of the patient. Total 4 cycles were done and there was an improvement between, which was seen between the first and the second cycle. So you can see that the LDH values came down, you can see that the SUD values came down, you can see that the ALP values came down. And even there was improvement in the general condition of the patient from a GCS score of 4 by 15, the score improved to 9 by 15. But this was not a constant improvement, there were fluctuations in the lab reports and the GCS of the patient thereafter. Um, but uh, the patient uh, was planned to have more, one more cycle, but uh, the patient was shifted to other hospital. I would like to ask Dr. Saxena to come and take the session for them. So till now there are a patient came with fever, joint pain, history of weight loss, diagnosed as a pyelonephritis, pneumonia in the ICU, then uh, ventilator associated pneumonia with acinipobacter gomiani. We were treating that, having a low GCS, TTP was diagnosed and we have done a four session of plasma phenesis. In between, in between the two sessions of plasma pheresis, there was an improve, improvement in the GCS, but after that there was no improvement in the GCS and platelet count was not improved. So, the issues, there was uh, no improvement in the GCS after the second cycle and weaning trial was going on. We have optimized the fluid, nutrition and electrolyte. AKA was ongoing and there was disease in urine output. So, dialysis was initiated. There is a, some trend of investigation, patient uh, came, so hemoglobin was on declining chain, so platelet was on declining chain, and platelet it never improved, and the SGOTPT uh, liver function test, initially it was rising, then the trend was declining, creatinine, the trend of creatinine was increasing. <coughs> so where are we and what we were treating? So, because the GCS was not improved, so we have planned for the MRI pain to be repeated and we have sent the ANA profile. So, I would like to request Dr. Yashvi uh, to discuss the repeat MRI finding. So, in the previous MRI, we saw the hyper intensities along the sulci and uh, on the repeat MRI, we can see the hyper intensities has been reduced along the sulci. But there is a uh, prominence of temporal horn of lateral ventricle as we compare with the previous one. There was very less visualization of the temporal horn, but in this image we can see the clear prominence of temporal horn of lateral ventricle. So this is an titubated coronal images indicating the again prominent lateral ventricles and the third ventricle. And in the previous one we can see the frontal horn of lateral ventricle is quite pointed. But in the repeat MRI, there is rounding of the frontal horn indicating the hydrocephalus. So the uh, inflammatory process is reduced, but there is development of mild hydrocephalus. I would, I would like to invite Dr. Sulekha to continue. So the repeat MRI was done. 
MRI was showing uh, hydrogen failures and mm -hmm. DNA profile was uh, positive. <coughs> we have sent the further workup. Plasma phalysis was ongoing. There was a difficulty in weaning. AKI was ongoing. Patient was on dialysis. Thrombocytopenia was still persisting. So renal biopsy was advised and bone marrow biopsy was advised. So we have taken the rheumatological advice. The uh, renal biopsy report was showing a thrombotic microangiopathy with acute tubular injury and histopathology was showing a hypercellular marrow with erythroid hyperplasia with no granuloma or malignancy. I would like to request uh, Dr. Adhar sir to come and discuss the clinical and neurological findings. Good morning to all of you and thank you Dr. Suleika. So this case presented a conundrum. So many things in a single patient, a triple jeopardy. So is it all SLE with Kiku cheese? Is it SLE with Kiku cheese with TBM with some component of ATT and receptitis, pyelonephritis, and sepsis induced cardiac dysfunction with like industry TT? So the same facts can prove both the theories. So let's go back to a core principle. Occam's razor, one explanation for all maladies. And Occam's professor who says that no path has to be complicated. So if you look at all history, so it explains the fever, the joint pains, the ANA reports, the ANA blot reports, the low complements. Myocarditis is well described which can explain the fallen blood pressure during ICU admission. TDP is rarely reported in SLE, with a prevalence of less than 0.5% in SLE patients. Even hydrocephalus has been reported in SLE, but now there are only 5 cases in literature. Transaminitis, well described, lupoid hepatitis, they can be coexistent AIH. Until 2014, the case review showed 35 cases. But they could be a non specific liver monomer, lupus, they might have been just subclinical cardiac involvement. So, since I am an assistant professor, I will go with Ocamstris. This is all lupus. And uh, because the CNS findings are very nice, there is hydrocephalus, yes. But as you have already seen, there is a compilation of very unusual findings in the same patient. So I would bet on all SLE. On the other hand, SLE can explain the joint pains, ANA, low complements, the CT abdomen at some fat stranding. When we discussed the radiologist at CU, since you don't have findings in the renal parenchyma, this could go either way. Transamidas could be drug related. A patient who had six months of joint pains in my country will have taken some complements in order to medicine. Whether the history is given or not, medicine has always been taken. The MRI findings could theoretically be explained with tubercular meningitis, with hydrocephalus is common theme up to 50% of patients. The already been just six cells. Thrombotic thrombocytopenic pervia TTP could either be a mixture of drug as well as lupus. So that's all I have to say. I have better than all I said. I'd like to call Dr. Srishti for the conclusion. So, question must be coming in the minds of the house sitting here that why we took such a complicated case for presenting today. And uh, we were facing challenges throughout the treatment of this patient in form of low GCS, altered sensorium, we were not able to wean her, bouts of fever, urine output was low, we had to go for hemodialysis. We couldn't really pinpoint the cause of lymphadenopathy. In the beginning, we were wanting to rule out Hodgkin's disease or a lymphoma. Uh, we had involved teams to rule out uh, malignancy in the beginning. Then we were working up to find out tuberculosis. Then we were working up to find the lupus. So uh, whenever we look the story after it has completed, you know, we can connect the dots only backwards. But at that time, when we were struggling with a patient who was so sick, he was, she was so sick in the beginning that we were struggling keeping her alive and that is the story of critical care every day. So we need to buy time, we need to buy time to keep the patient alive until we all as a team can work up about the diagnosis, manage the sepsis, uh, do all the investigations and we were very unfortunate in this case that the patient succumbed to cardiac death and in lupus one of the most common causes of death is uh, cardiac <coughs> complication. And uh, multiple cases have been reported, but very, very few literature, in the literature we could find very few cases which could, you know, pick up every diagnosis and keep it together. This is like one of the very rare cases where lupus, with TB meningitis, with query Kikuchi disease, 
everything putting up together, we could hardly found, find cases in the literature. We were finding two out of three, but then three out of three we were not able to find out. So this is uh, my concluding slide that this is what we are. We come smiling every day. We are kind of uh, hidden agents hiding amongst everyone. And all what we plan and intend to do every day is to work with everyone together and safeguard our patients, to keep them alive, to make the diagnosis. And we do get rewards sometimes in which they go back home smiling. We have a syndromic approach in critical care where we focus on systematic approach, point of care tests and ultrasound, infection control bundles, good nursing care, meeting the nutrition targets of our patients. Saxena sir is uh, one of the biggest proponents of nutrition in critical care and I would say when we deal with such critical patients, this is one thing which gets forgotten. Targeted fluid therapy, VAP bundles, tracheostomy care and holistic approach in form of physiotherapies, mobilization, rehabilitation. And not, not, uh, not the least psychological support to the patient and the family member. Life is nothing but time. I would request Dr. Nashish to come and say the word of thanks. Okay, very good morning to everyone. Uh, uh, I am uh, very much agree with Dr. Shashti that uh, the role of a critical care consultant is like the conductor of an orchestra. We have to uh, manage everyone with everything so that the music which you listen will be good. But unfortunately, this patient succumbs to death. Uh, I would like to uh, express my heartfelt gratitude to our MDT Chase person, sir, MS Swankar, sir, who always blessed us, who always have faith in us, and who provide us constant blessings with which we are today uh, the leading critical care department in the state. I would also like to express uh, my thanks to the CCR review committee, all the members who provide us guidance and their expertise during the preparation of this CCR, it is a very lengthy one. They sit four times, uh, if I am not wrong. And uh, I would like to thank everyone, all the dignitaries who is present here, all the department HODs and other consultants, and my fellow colleagues, my residents, along with the nurses and the back office staff who work in the ICU for the betterment of the patient. I also want to extend my sincere thank to the patient's family who was very supportive, who kept faith in us. This patient stays in our hospital for a month time. With repeated investigation, during the patient counseling session, they asked us what is the diagnosis and we were not uh, right, able to tell us that this is the most probable diagnosis. We always tell them about the differential diagnosis. Ye bhi ho sakta, ye bhi ho sakta, ye bhi ho sakta. Patient was so sick, and uh, the condition of the patient is always vexing and meaning. Sometimes she woke up, she woke up, and sometimes she was having a GCS of three. But despite all odds, they always um, have faith in our and believe in our capabilities. And uh, in the last, you know, I would like to express my thanks to all of you for your patient hearing. Thank you very much.